I would like to make an announcement. I am perhaps the least common expert of this whole event. But why should you listen to this talk? Don't worry. The expert is just one minute away. She's called Gina. But you are the experts. Although all of you can implement and optimize Lean Kanban perfectly, often you did not reach the maximum impact which is possible. It's just really too often missed dramatically, in our opinion. When you reach the limits, you accept these limits very often much too soon. And we all gave up much too soon. It is too often optimized only within the agile bubble. We experienced the superpower in our transformation. And that's why we are not ready to accept these limits. We have found solutions to push these limits much further. Please listen to our story, but listen for yourself. Where we stood, where we wanted, what we wanted, and how we achieved that. And finally, what this could mean to you. Hello, my name is Gina, and I would like to tell you a little about Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist is a classical internet agency, and we exist since 23 years. This is our status quo, and five years ago, I would not have imagined that. I feel very good about my company, and I'm quite proud of what we have achieved. Nowadays, we have 74 employees, and just to give you an impression, Typical projects rank from several hundred thousands of euros and um, we support well-known customers. So this is our status quo. So where do we come from? Six years ago, we started our agile transformation. That means after 18 years of typical old school traditional agency work. Our situation these times were really a little bit disappointing. We were almost 30 employees. We had a lot of experience and we really, really could do some things really quite well. But the results, hmm, sometimes the results were good and makes us happy. But nevertheless, there were still too many bad faces. Still, there was too often the fight for the black zero to pay the next trend and the next salaries. So, to get a good idea of how such typical project goes, I would like to tell you a little story. A story of a typical internet project, and unfortunately, this story is for real for a lot of agencies these times. The story I would like to tell you is the story about Project Island. And here are the secrets of projects. You can see this old traditional book of Project Island. So listen carefully. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful island. An island where people lived who loved to do projects. They loved it because they were very good at doing projects they could leave the island at any time. But they stayed voluntary on the island because doing projects was their passion. Of course, there were some not so nice places on the island. For example, ooh, the castle. The castle of the king. He's called King Client. He made all the rules. He made all the important decisions of the project, of course, what to do and how to do it. This was a century-long tradition. And why? Hmm. Because he paid all the projects. That was the reason. Perhaps the most scary place on the whole island was the horrible estimation cave. All the inhabitants of the island admired those who possessed the incredible abilities of estimation. They admired those 
who dared to make the incredible time-consuming and painful estimates and negotiations inside the cave. And only if you look at this place from far away, you could see that it did not need any special skills to estimate in such detail. Because if we were far enough, you could see it is just a clumsy look into a crystal ball. And another place no one appreciated were these fields. These fields of specifications. All the details of the huge projects were always defined where a whole year in advance, for example, and everyone acted as if they really knew everything in advance. But in the project there were the many changes and wishes which of course had to be included. Even though they were not described in the 100 page of the specs, so next time these details uh, were also written extensively in these specs and so the fields of specs grew higher and higher from year to year. But the wishes and changes that were described nowhere and still had to be inclusive were unfortunately not a bit small. But as soon as the supposed last hurdles of waste are overcome, the happy time on Project Island returns. Everyone was happy in the great project. Yes, also King Client. Time and money were still sufficiently available because we are in the beginning of a one-year project so that he could demand and enforce more and more fancy special requests. And maybe that's why the time of happiness did not last very long. Large project loads darkened the sky of Project Island. The next scary place after this short period of happiness, trouble times began again. In the project, the constant fighting and eternal arm wrestling. Oh, my wife has seen this fancy navigation at Ikea or Porsche this weekend. That would be great for us, wouldn't it? And why is the Siamese feature not included? So shiny, okay. It's never mentioned in the offer, but nor in the specifications, nor in the contract, but that's obvious in this feature, that feature we have to have. It has to be inclusive. That's why we choose Sidegeist as our agency. After two or three more endless meetings, okay, then we have to pay extra for this special feature and the other special request, and then all of these features has to be specified precisely, and the price we have to bargain again. And of course, the timing has to keep anyway. Unfortunately, these fights, these fight clubs can be found on various locations on Project Island. And if they have not died yet, they bargain, they define, they estimate, describe and redefine. They theorize and argue and fight until today. And the moral of the story, there is none. But for you, much better. The best thing about this story of Project Island is, this story is just a fairy tale. So five years ago, what was the situation of our agency? I found a bunch of nice people back then. I liked them very much from the beginning. But for me, not only the problem was obvious, but also the solution. And as you heard, we had a lot of problems. All the Project Island problems you heard of had some general effects like we were not able to act, but were only reacting. We had only little innovation. We were not scalable, so we had no growth. All in all, we were not happy. So, in the second half of 2014, we started to become agile at Zeitgeist. The idea for sure was to react faster and to balance demand and capability. So Sven and I developed a goal. First step was to set ourselves out to building cross-functional teams. 
At the first glance, Sven thought, that's not possible. But after some discussions, he began to see how reaction time could be enhanced by implementing decision making into the team. Although he had the feeling to lose control from time to time, we never lost control. We simply slowly moved away from command and control. But as you all know, it certainly makes a big difference to have an idea and get it started. So what we did first was to create awareness, enhance communication, enhance transparency, enable involvement and create acceptance for change, taking care for the need of security. That is what I mean. The outcome was pretty clear, except of one person. Everybody wanted to move towards building cross-functional teams. We wanted to give all needed decision-making power into the team to react quickly. The idea was a, bit, a, bit, a little bit like going back to startup times when the company had 10 people and moved very, very quickly. So in January 2015, we met as one big team with 30 people, distributed in four departments like graphics, development, project management and concept. After one day, we came back as three cross-functional teams. Such teams incorporate all skills we need to deliver the project, from first spe specification to delivery. The team scales from 6 to 11. We only excluded back office administration and acquisition of new customers. Everybody joined in the team building, so this was an activity of joint forces, not dominated by any executives. We gave some boundaries and a lot of leeway. Surely the outcome was not perfect, but for the first iteration it was pretty amazing and the teams started to work right away. So everybody moved desks the next working day. So secondly, we decided for Kanban for the evolutionary change. We did decide for Kanban based on a core culture questionnaire. Everybody filled out anonymously the one by William Schneider. You might know that. Here you can see an end-to-end -end board of our e-commerce team. You can see the upstream, the downstream, and the VIP limits. We use Kanban in every team. This is one of the boundaries we said you should use Kanban. Surely they started with what they did back then. So first steps was visualization and feedback loops. And this for sure changed the teams over time. We also used Kanban for changing the whole structure, meaning the transition. This helped me a lot to track the situation and see what was going on and what the next steps could be. From the beginning, Sven was very highly involved and 100% supportive. We had a lot of vivid discussions and Sven's task was to make the goals idea I presented bulletproof. This was never an easy and calm process, for sure, but more like treating the goals and ideas with sandpaper. We developed a pretty good contending culture and feedback culture. As you know, feedback loops are essential. They need to be done, and the smaller you increment, the faster you move. This only worked out because we enabled the teams from the very beginning to move on their own. To make this possible, we implemented the two Kanban roles. Although the roles had no name back then and were not accepted by the whole Kanban community, so we invented them ourselves. So they had another name in our Sidegeist universe and a slightly other profile, but all in all they match. The people in these roles took care of that it happened from the very first day on. Um, they do this as an additional role to their daily job and are granted time and leeway to do so. The SDR is voted yearly by the team and the SRM is suggested yearly by the team and needs to be accepted by Sven. But what really happened five years ago is following. Let's go back to Project Island. We had an enchanted prince named Sven. And he has been enchanted for almost 20 years. One day, an agile fairy named Gina came by. He told her his story 
and she redeemed him. Abra Kadabra. And they found themselves at today's Zeitgeist. This is the real story what happened. And they all lived happily ever after. Thank you, Gina. And it was so incredibly effective for us that there were so many benefits in this really smart Kanban stuff that we wanted to do more stuff of this cool, crazy Kanban stuff. Um, and so we started as an old school agency doing old school business like all other, our clients and we are turned into an agile company. But to be honest, we felt very, very lonely because we do not work for Sidecast projects. We had our cool teams and very agile, but we were in a kind of an agile bubble because we work for projects of our clients and that was our situation. Um, we were the agile bubble surrounded by all the old school stuff. Because the world of our client was absolutely dis different. They only know old school. Yeah? It was a little bit spooky what we are doing with them. And they told us, ah, okay, maybe you are right. And, but then they really started to tell us our, their story. And it was always the same story. And you know, it's the story of Project Island. And yes, they said, maybe you are right and do whatever you want, but <laughs> not with us. We want to work with you, but not this crazy HR way. Um, at that time, I heard a talk from uh, this guy uh, from Vasco Duarte. And uh, yeah, he is the um, evangelist from No Estimates, okay? And to make it short, uh, the conclusion of his topic is estimates don't work. This shouldn't be new for you. You know that. Be honest. Therefore, the main question remains why you don't act accordingly. I mean, how is your reality? 20 times you make a huge and detailed estimation and 19 to 20 times. It fails. And you even know in which direction it will fail. But the 21st time, you really believe and behave like, yes, this time it will really work. No, <laughs> estimations do not work. So skip them. In big projects, you have offers, specs, contracts, the arm wrestling during the project. This whole bunch of waste is at least 30% of the project of the time and of the money in the project. And this is a third which does not add any value to your project. So skip it. But then there's the client. He says, oh no, this is not possible for us. Maybe it's true and nice idea and you're so right, but uh, no, not with us. It's not possible. Really, Mr. Dietz, it's not possible. So if you know examples, yeah, from your own, own situation that are really impossible. I mean, impossible with the client, the project, uh, the department, the special situation, uh, or with a special person, it's maybe really not possible. If you're convinced that you know this kind of stuff, then please concentrate on the next slide. Focus now. Until the end of this talk, your mind and your synapses are now open to receive something new. That could be very interesting because what you thought is not true. We decided not to stay inside our agile bubble. No, we declared fight to old school business. Yeah? Right now I'm a realist in German and Gina is a realist in, and we started with no more waste. I mean, one third of the project. The truth is, whether it will cost 150,000 or 250,000 euros, we don't know. 
and the other agencies, they also don't know. The main thing which decides whether it will end on 150 or 250,000 is the behavior of the client. Does he understand lean and agile? Then we will end maybe less than 150,000. And if not, then maybe more than 250,000. Um, but no estimates, absolutely no estimates, does not work for client because you can't say, ah, we don't know how long it does take and how, long, how much it will cost. And we will see at the end of the project. Nobody will do this. So what we tried to find out was raw estimates. We invented raw estimates. Uh, this is the smallest possible amount of old school stuff to create enough security and certainty for the client. And this is how it looks like. Um, this is a raw estimation. Yeah? Imagine a call for a new agency. Okay, someone calls us, hey, yeah, we're looking for a new agency. We want to do a relaunch. Okay. Uh, we pretend to, do, to take part of this pitch and um, then we try to find out what their real goals are and maybe they really need a relaunch. But sometimes we find out what their real goals are and then it's a very cool situation to show them that you don't want their whole money. Um, but this is how it looks like. After some talks with the clients, some calls, uh, we have a huge raw, not a huge, a raw estimation how much it could be. We can tell them we are able to do it within 250,000 euro, within 12 months, and we need this, I don't know, 120 modules. And here are some examples here for the modules. Um, and this is the whole description for the modules. There is no description text. I mean, there we have uh, search, okay? This is a description for, there will be a search and how big and with, with kind of features we will decide together within the project to use the money as clever, clever as it can be. Sometimes they receive um, a heat map as an offer. Ooh, that's confusing for them. Yeah, we need a near offer, a real offer, really, really. And the range, Mr. Dietz, um, it's very big. I mean, couldn't it be a little bit more specific? Um, then my answer often is yes, that was also my first thought when we received your requirement. Um, and there is no detail in what are your real results are. We really try to find out what they want. They don't want a relaunch. Why they want a relaunch. They want an effect and why they need this effect. And really ask them what they want, what they really want, what they really, really want. And then sometimes you can say, okay, if this is your real goal, then maybe you don't need this huge relaunch. Maybe we can get this effect uh, with just a small percentage of time and money in maybe 50, 60% of this wanted effect in just creating some, yeah, some quick wins. Uh, and this is very effective. And then two days later, we have the first quick win workshop with them. And, um, they see, okay, they are really consulting us. I mean, they don't want to take our whole money and that really creates trust. And then, like magic, the pitch has gone. Estimations really do not work, but what works is prediction. Estimation is to think and discuss about uh, uh, when you have zero percentage of real experience in the specific project. But after one week, you have the first numbers and two weeks of the, and so we make a prediction. Predictions are possible. And so we are working in our real concept with prediction sheets. That means we have these kind of cool uh, Excel uh, sheets. And um, in these Excel sheets, we have the name of the modules. And each week we just write down a one means, okay, it's done. And then 0 0.5, it's 50% it's, it's done. And then we also um, type in um, how many hours we have been uh, uh, worked on this uh, in this week for these modules. And this creates each week um, 
uh, cool graphs where you can see uh, are we uh, spending too much money, are we uh, too expensive, are we cheap, are we fast, are we slow, and we create some extrapolations of, uh, uh, of the actual numbers and we can talk with the client and we always have a good control uh, also with this crazy stuff what we're doing uh, in this project. And in our experience much better control than in these normal old school projects. So, how do they pay us? They pay us per hour. We are really lean. We have one hour hourly rate. This is 120 euro per hour in creating digital projects. This is my rate and this is the rate for our junior and uh, junior developers as well. So there is only one rate. Very easy. Yeah? We, 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 uh, we Make our, we write down our hours, we multiply them with an hourly rate and then you get an invoice. And the cool stuff regarding the invoice is uh, the following. Um, if you don't like it, you don't have to pay. I mean, you didn't audit something. We, we don't need a contract. No, we start without a contract. Yeah? We declare the goals with the client. We make, with our experience and our skills, we make the raw estimation and we try to beat the time and the money and then we go and to reach the result as lean as possible. And it really works. Here we have some blurry stuff. And all the green stuff, that means the extrapolation of these projects are right now that we will end under the raw estimation. I mean, we will be faster and uh, it will cost less than estimated. So, we are sitting in the same boat with our clients, working together on eye level. We want to save his money. We very often say, uh, well, this is a fancy idea, but I think you don't need it. I mean, we don't want this, this money for this. We think it's already done. And this is very convincing for the client that we want, don't want to take the money. We want to achieve really the goal. And yeah, how we do, do we do it in the, um, in the reality? Uh, we try to do it as lean as possible and we have a very, very strong uh, 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 weapon for this. And this weapon is first to define goals. What are your goals? No more than three goals. And it's possible. And then we are trying to delete the fancy stuff, the nice to haves, all these crazy stuff. and. Uh, we are very, very strict with the client. That means when there's these, all these fancy rebriefing, oh, thank you very much for your design, and we like it a lot, and maybe you could do this line a little bit thicker, maybe one pixel, and the shadow a little bit darker, and stuff like that. This won't work with us. This is waste of money, and we don't want to waste the money from our clients. So we invented the very famous Ponyhof. It's German for um, yeah, pony yard, for a horse yard, where everything is fine. And all these fancy ideas couldn't be a little bit nicer, warmer, darker, or stuff like that. This maybe it could be okay, nice idea. We will write it on the Ponyhof list. This is this also here. You can write it down on a notepad. And uh, yeah, oh, it's an interesting idea, we'll write it down, but we won't do it now. Because this fancy idea is for sure not this task which will create the biggest value in the next step. So we will write it down and finally we will see whether we have some uh, money and time left. We can have a look on this long ponyhof list and maybe we think uh, <laughs> it was a nice idea in that moment. but. We don't really need it. And this is a very, very good way to cope with these fancy ideas, these nice to have, these ribbons, these egg laying wool milk pigs, um, all these useless shadows, useless personal opinions and tastes. Clients are paying so much money just for their opinion and their taste. And it's our work to be a real consultant to tell them that they don't need it. The never ending edge cases, they all live here on this ponyhof. And write it down, but don't do their fancy ponyhof stuff. This creates the biggest amount of things you can uh, um, 
you can uh, spend less for your projects. So this is very, very effective. And then you are able to build house with roofs, no? not the best uh, door, entrance door and, and gold and shiny and, and finally you don't have any money for the roof. We build a house which will fit to your expectations, which will achieve the defined goals. Not everything is super duper, but it will achieve the goals. And do everything in 80%, then there will be 20% money and time left and then we can decide which of the fanciest wishes from the Pony of Liste maybe we can do and which will create the biggest value for the project. So, the, the clients sometimes say, yeah, you are right, but ah, we don't want to do it. Um, you don't have to start with all your clients at the same time, wait for the right moment. And for every client, for every client, there will be the right moment. And there's also a kind of magic trick to achieve this. We had a client where everybody said, after one year of real, everybody said, oh, real is so cool, but this client, he will never do it that way. But then there was a meeting, and it was a fine meeting, and then he said, oh, Mr. Dietz, uh, I, have, um, I have a description, a briefing for you, and we see each other next week. Please bring a specified offer, not too expensive. I will sign it because we need it. It's urgent and uh, is very important. Switch. Next week, his first question was, oh, Mr. Dietz, do you have my offer? And I said, no, I don't have your offer. I don't waste the time to make an estimation, uh, theoretically, to think about maybe how much it could be. It was so safe, your briefing, that we know what to do. We just did it. We know that it took 68 hours. This is no estimation, this is the truth. Okay? We took the risk and we are ready. And it was a little bit, oh my God, who gave you? No, nobody gave us an offer. It was just our risk, it was so safe, we did it to show you how fast it can be. Because you said it is important and you need it very, very urgent, so there is no other method to be faster than this. And that was very convincing for him. And, and he was fair and he said, wow, 68 hours just for this long pager? That's a good price. I mean, last time it, well, it was more than the double of the price. And I said, yeah, but sometimes if we do it lean, it's possible that way. And he has to do it to see it, to feel it in real and not in the theoretically. And wait for this opportunity and then work in advance, take the risk and convince him. And there's no argument for him not to do it the next time the same way. And then you have as a result, faster, cheaper, better projects. It really, really Work. And that was uh, the base for our success in this stuff. And then it began to run and creates uh, the first uh, bigger attention. And this is a topic where Gina can tell us a little bit more. This all not only made it possible to implement two other products in our portfolio, but also attract some attention. As a consequence, we wrote articles about it and did several talks. In addition, our customers and other agencies saw that we fixed problems which they have themselves. We were asked to help <coughs> by our customers and other agency, so we did help. What was surprising to us, that not only agency like ourselves and our customers asked for help, but also companies unknown to us and far outside our section of industry. The most interesting case study here was Schwaberke, editor and publisher of books. In fact, the oldest printing house in the world. Over 500 years ago, they printed the Bible for Luther. So this is real old school business. And it has really attracted attention. Here you can see how Swiss television is making a documentary about the transition. This documentary was aired at the end of last year.
All this led us to the decision to set up another company, Zeitgeist Agile Transformation. So, you might ask me what the main reasons are why such a transition can work. Now, I give you the six lessons I learned. Make sure a competent team leads through a change. A team of leadership, credibility, analytical and communicational skills, avertiveness and ongoing engagement. Repeat, but do not lose patience. People change slowly, and so be aware of that. Give them time and take the time to explain and discuss things which are going on. This applies internally as well as externally. So you need patience with your people as well as with the customers. If you want to dig into this, I recommend Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Put a lot of value on a good community. This also applies internally as well as externally. Always remember that communicate that everyone is, the same, is in the same boat and take care that everybody learns to communicate at eye level, no matter who to whom. On the long run, this will convert your culture. Use Kanban. Kanban is an excellent way to evolutionary change systems. Take care that you really know what Kanban is, really is. This counts for everybody, but especially for the CEO and the management level. Embrace Kaizen and remember, be like water. It flows around the stone, but in the end, it cuts canyon into continents. Pay attention to trust. This is one of the core values, internally as well as externally. This may not be easy to achieve in a competitive world, but there is a simple trick that means a leap of faith. This also applies internally and externally. The effect is clear. Just lead by example. The others will follow. Follow Cotter. John P. Cotter is a thought leader of in business leadership and change. In my opinion, you are well advised if you follow John Cotter's eight steps process for leading change. It is a good framework for Kaizen. I highly recommend his books, Our Iceberg is Melting, Changing and Succeeding Under Any Conditions. It's a short and easy to read book and a simple fable. It tells a charming story about a penguin colony in Antarctica and illustrates the key truth about how we deal with the issue of change. Distribute this book in a massive quantity in the group. So, how do I get the customer to stay lean continuously? So, thank you, Gina, for your core learnings. And this leads me to the last question, how to leave the Agile bubble? And one important thing is really to know what are your abilities, what are the things which you really love, which are the things where you, your clients, your company are really good in. And don't try to sell everything to everyone. Um, this is the best strategy. And if you know what you really love and how to do the projects, and all of you know how is the best way to do the projects, don't stop at 50%. I mean, all of you who are watching these kind of talks at Enterprise Agility Europe know everywhere, okay? I admire your skills, your knowledge about Kanban and Lean, but please do not stop too early. Don't believe the stories of the clients that this is not impossible. Try all these magic tricks. And one of the magic tricks is shift the perspective. I mean, view it from that perspective and you know what is possible and change the reality. If you can't convince them in the theory, just make it happen. I mean, that was one of the main tricks, the magic trick. Don't bring an offer. Bring the already ready project which is already programmed and he can use it and then he knows that the 68 hours are possible. And don't believe the briefing, the input from the client. Find out what they want, what they really want, what they really, 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 really want. And then they will see that you want to consult him, that you are true and you will save money for them. And this is finding out core goals, the biggest problems, and the leanest, the fastest, the smallest solutions. Find out all these stuff which helps a lot very fast. And then, just do it. 
Don't make it theoretically. No, lead by example. Yeah? Find out which has the best result with a small investment. Show them. Show them what is possible. Make it real. Yeah? And don't accept these silly, oh no, you're so true, but ah, not with us and it's not possible. Then just do it. Do it in advance. Okay? If you're sure, take the risk. That is really convincing. That is really convincing. I can promise you. These are the core learnings from this 68 hour story. And the story is not a story. The story is true. This is the way you can convince uh, your clients and um, they will see that their old school business is not valid anymore. So fight the old school business. Don't believe the old stories. Be a realist or be a realistin. And um, I won't accept, yeah, you're so, so interesting theory and I love real, but uh, not with our clients. No, I don't want to know with which client or which project is this absolutely not possible. This is not interesting. Let's focus on where it could be possible. Okay, start with the one where maybe and then you will make more experience in how to sell the stuff, how to do these kind of projects and you will see that it is possible. But please, please think about agility and you know all the rules. Do it step by step. I mean, viva la evolución. Yeah, and you can really make it happen. You can achieve much more, so much more with your cool and great knowledge about Kanban and agility. And don't think, I, I will think about it. Maybe I will try it. No, it won't work. Please do me a favor. Start now or at least tomorrow. And if you want to have it in one short sentence, find out what you love, what you really, really love, I mean, and then you can see this is what you know. You have to know what you really love. And then if you're in projects and you want to fight these old school business, then it comes to raw estimations. And just add it to it and you will see that your projects will go better and better and then always stay with your agility, not in theory, do it for real, add it. And finally, stay always lean, show them where the Ponyhof list is really important, where they can save money and finally you have your final goal and you will say together with the clients, we love real, start it, try it and find out what the power of real Kanban is. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your attention and I would like to say goodbye to you but we are curious about your questions so please throw them in now. Well thank you Sven and Jaina for sharing the magic of Project Island. We have them here ready for questions. How are you doing? Looks like we may have a little bit of challenge here. Oh. We know what's up here. Get in here, see what's going on. Try to get them back online. We're having a little bit of difficulty with their connection earlier. All right, we don't quite know what's happening. We're trying to solve the problems. So bear with us, and we'll try to figure out what uh, if we can get them back online. I certainly came away with quite a few few things from the talk. Um, I think the uh, the interesting challenges are are uh, <coughs> dealing with with um, old school customers is often a challenge. Um, I'm very curious as to what sort of challenges they had and if they lost any customers that were 
unwilling to move away from, from the project island. Um, We also had to some of the questions we had, some people are interested in understanding um, whether they were able to, regarding the estimates, were they able to, were they had experimented with probabilistic estimations uh, in order to get some quick feedback on project delivery dates. Um, in the talk, I think they, they demonstrated that they were using forecasting. I don't, they didn't indicate whether they were using, uh, I didn't see them using probabilistic forecasting, but uh, they very well could have been. So we'll see check in with them on that. Um, certainly, if we're not able to reconnect with them, we will get them the questions to them and uh, get them answered for you. Another interesting question here is, if, with a single rate for everyone, how did you accommodate capacity allocation on a project? You know, senior versus junior professionals, how did you effectively communicate it to the customer? It was an interesting question about whether there was, uh, and this sort of connects it back to York's talk about culture, um, is the question of whether they have used this approach with different cultures, in particular Latin cultures, for example, uh, and whether that the uh, the culture would have any any impact on this. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, you hear something? Are we back? Um, can, can you hear us? We hear you. Okay. So um, we, we arranged something because of the technical problems. Um, if there are questions which we could not answer now, then maybe we arranged to, to uh, buffer one hour today. If someone is, uh, has questions which could not be asked right now here, it's uh, possible uh, just to write an, uh, an email to, to Gina, it's uh, steiner at sideguys.de. And uh, if you write us a mail, then you get an invitation and we have one hour for answering questions, maybe so that's a good solution for these kind of problems. But the minutes which, are, which we have right now, we can use also for, for doing some answers right now. Yeah, very good, I appreciate so, that. We make sure that, that we do have quite a few questions and you know, great, fantastic, um, uh, Tale, tale of Project Island, uh, really loved it. People are really enjoying the presentation. And I, I know we've got lots of questions, but we probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll pick out a few, few critical ones. Um, one, one that I had here to start with is, is whether you, you, in the process of this, uh, of interfacing with customers, some of the old school customers, uh, did, you, did you lose any or did you have, to have any challenges? I mean, worse, we know we had challenges, but I was curious whether you felt like you lost any or you chose, you chose to go away from customers that you didn't feel were, were um, a good fit for you. Yeah. Um, the main effect regarding this topic is that we lost a lot of clients because we quit with them. That was is absolutely not normal for agencies. We told them, you're a good customer, we're a good agency, but we don't fit together. Um, this is, this we, did not, we didn't do in, in, in the past, but this, we try to find out which customer fits to us. But uh, nowadays we can say, um, there is a huge number of clients where one of the main reasons to choose side guys is the absolute extreme agility we are handling uh, the kind of projects. They can't believe it, but they want to give it a try because they want agility also, but they can't believe that it will work. And um, yeah, it, it developed to one of the main reasons for a client choosing Sidegeist and also for um, new colleagues for um, H&R. Uh, it's one of the main reasons to, to choose Sidegeist as a, as a company to work for. Yeah, that's great. That's a good point you bring up about um, creating an environment where people want to work. So you're, you're recruiting and that's a competitive advantage for you. So that's great, uh, great news there. Um, the question here, um, did you have a strategy to implement WIP limits in order to improve flow efficiency and predictability? And since predictability is a pretty important part of your, your overall story of uh, trying to narrow in on a, on a target. Yeah, um, since we do, uh, we work with WIP limits, but we left that decision uh, to the teams. So um, we did not like 
push the BIP limits on it. It was more like um, we tried to explain it and we tried to um, yeah, um, guide, give guidance and on how to implement it. And we just um, enhanced knowledge about BIP limits in the teams and they made uh, some experiments and then the team decided for the BIP limits or um, yeah, some teams did not yet. So um, um, regarding the um, predictability, uh, since we have in all teams a daily replenishment, it moves so fast <clears throat> that we do not really need the predictability. The delivery is so fast that um, there is no need for the customer regarding that. Okay, great. And then I guess also with regards to predictability, we're, I, we saw that you were doing some forecasting. Were you doing any uh, Monte Carlo simulation to get um, ranges of forecasts or we're primarily just a uh, extrapolation? Yeah, we're working based on the extrapolation and uh, the idea for that uh, definitely uh, comes from um, uh, Vasco Duarte with the no estimates. The raw yeah. estimation idea is um, really based on that idea, but we uh, found out that no estimation does not work with our customers, so they get the raw estimation, which is a very lean and fast way to give them the necessary information up front. Okay, great. Um, there was an interesting question about culture, tying back to a talk from York yesterday, um, as to whether you had used this in multiple cultures or, and, and they were particularly interested in perhaps a, a Latin culture. Um, what, uh, um, what has been your experience there? Has it been mostly in, in the, the Dutch region or has it been uh, broader? Well, um, <clears throat> we had a more or less uh, homogeneous culture, and um, <clears throat> we found that out with a with a, um, um, uh, tell me the the uh, poll we did uh, based on uh, William Schneider. So I can only tell you that in our case we had a, a relatively homogeneous uh, culture, and this told us, for example, that we should go forward with Kanban and not with Scrum, because in the beginning it was not clear what kind of agility would help us. But for our culture, Kanban was the way to go, based on that um, all we did. Okay. Um, here's an interesting question um, relating to your, you were mentioning um, Cotter at the, at the end, someone that, that uh, we're well aware of. And you are mentioning this Cotter's philosophy, which seems to emphasize more of a top-down approach um, and Kanban's evolutionary focus. Do they, have you found that those are go hand in hand? Are they in conflict? Or um, what's what's been your uh, view on that? I do not really understand uh, the question. Um, can you explain what you mean with a, a top-down approach? Well, there's elements of um, sort of the change. change so there's, there's some people interpret Cotter to say that change is driven from the top, from from the from the very, you know, and more of a, a, a you know, less of a, of a self-evolution and mm -hmm. more of a uh, bigger design okay, up front um, that you want. And, yeah, um, it, it, yeah, sure. Um, I, I think um, the, the, if, you, if I want to describe what we really did, then we moved from the top and from, from the bottom. And uh, for sure, the, then the, the problem is a little bit uh, the layer between. Um, but what we did is just we um, had a rough idea where we can head and for sure I need to tell that to the CEO because I'm changing the company. So uh, this guy needs to be on my side. So first you have the idea and you tell the CEO and then the CEO needs to be convinced and else if he does not stay by your side and supports you, um, then he simply will not join in and then at some point he will just stop the, the transition. So this was the first step, but afterwards we moved from the bottom. So the first step was from the from from Cotter, but the the people who joined in the, the transition were not the management. We just um, convinced the CEO this is a good way to go. I convinced Sven, and then the people joined in from everywhere. So this was not the management or the upper management, not the the middle management or whatsoever. The people joining in the transition teams, they were just out of the company. Maybe uh, the the person working at Sidecast for one year, mm -hmm. maybe a guy who already works there for 15 years. So it, it didn't matter. And, and, and it was a kind of a, um, an evolutionary revolution. I mean, we really did it the agile way step by step. 
But um, from the beginning, we know that we do not want to end in, in a soft way and do a little bit kind of the stuff. Um, after the convincing uh, um, uh, infos from Gina, it was really clear for me that there are so many benefits in it that we have to do it really dramatic change. And if I compare our agency right now with the agency six years ago, almost everything turned around 180% and it works so much better. And finally, did you lose customers? The financial situation uh, um, for our agency is so much better. I can show you every graph regarding financial stuff and every everyone would be able to point where we started with real. This is where all the graphs are starting to went up uh, instead of going slowly down every year. Well, thank you. It's very good, very um, excellent talk, and we really appreciate it. We will have a few more questions for you, so we'll make sure we, we get those to you. And thank you very much. So, so maybe you can see us tomorrow. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>